All right, welcome back everybody to another video. Today, we are going to be brewing a New England IPA with a Voss Quike strain, uh, and that is going to be in a new fermenter that I picked up recently. Uh, but first of all, before we get into any details, if you're new here, I just want to welcome you and say thanks for checking this out. This channel is all about grain and glass videos where I go ahead and brew beer, uh, basically from start to finish all in the same video, so you get to see the recipe, any mistakes I made, or any processes that I used, uh, and then what happens to the final beer at the end of the process. And I also try to do all of that from the lens of what I would consider to be your average home brewer. I don't really have very high-end equipment and I try to do the most I can with the least I can, if that makes sense. Hopefully this provides you with some good information uh, if you decide to make this kind of beer. Um, so without getting into too much detail, it has been a little while since I brewed. However, um, I was able to pick up some very fun little treats when I went back to my homebrew store. So I picked up a, a uh, packet of the Voss strain of Quike yeast. Uh, so we'll get into that a little bit more in the video later. Uh, but I also picked up at a steep discount a Firmzilla uh, 27 liter or about 7 gallon uh, capacity pressure capable fermenter. Uh, it's a conical fermenter made out of PET plastic. This particular brew uh, would definitely benefit from pressure fermentation. However, I was not able to pick up the pressure kit at the same time I picked up the fermenter and my recipe ingredients. So we will not be doing this brew under pressure fermentation. I'll save that for another time, uh, but I'll probably do something like a lager just to see how it does. Uh, so New England IPAs uh, are becoming one of my favorite kinds of beer. I used to really not like them at all, uh, and then I started brewing them more, and I was realizing that they're actually quite a bit of fun to make and also to drink. Uh, so, I mean, it's been said everywhere. You're gonna find this anytime you do research for New England IPA, but the key to having a successful one is low oxygen levels after your fermentation begins. Because this beer is so heavily dry hopped, it is extremely sensitive to oxygen, which causes it to spoil uh, and stale faster than most other beers. So really, every single step in the process needs to be taken where uh, you minimize exposure to oxygen. That being said, if you get some in there, it's not gonna ruin your beer. It's just gonna shorten the shelf life a little bit. So uh, I have made New England IPAs on this channel before twice. The first time I made it, I bottled it, and um, that ended up having a pretty short shelf life. Uh, the beer was good, but only for a very short period of time. So if you are bottling, I highly recommend figuring out a way to purge the headspace in those bottles with CO2, and that will drastically lengthen the amount of time uh, that your beer will stay fresh. The second New England IPA I did in this channel, um, I did with kegs, and that drastically improved the lifetime of the beer. Uh, at the same time, I also fermented it in a bucket, so it can be done. Uh, as long as you take very careful care to purge headspace with CO2, and especially to do some sort of closed or semi-closed transfer when you're going from your fermentation vessel to your keg or bottles. What I did in that situation was to purge the keg with CO2. Easiest way to do that is to fill it up with sanitizer, push out that sanitizer with CO2, and then put your beer into it, uh, minimizing the amount of times you have to open that up. Now, if that's not possible for you, I would recommend probably trying a different kind of beer unless you're capable of drinking whatever you brew very quickly. Um, but it, I'm not saying it's impossible and I'm not saying you shouldn't try it. But because I didn't really learn all this stuff out of nowhere, I had to try it several times and through several iterations was able to figure out what worked. But anyway, rambling aside, today I'm gonna be brewing this New England IPA with a pressure capable fermenter. And once I get that pressure kit, I will be able to do a true closed transfer on this thing. So we will be doing that for this particular brew. And we'll see if it lasts any longer than the four or five weeks that my last New England IPA was fresh for. Like I said, I've done several videos on the New England IPA before, so I'm not going to get into too much detail as to how to make it. If you really want a detailed breakdown of how to make a good New England IPA, just check out my second video. It's the one that's more professional looking, and I will link that right up here in the corner for you to check out. So anyway, the recipe that I'm doing today uh, really is very similar to that last recipe with a couple key changes. First of all, I slimmed down the grain bill a little bit, and second of all, um, I'm only doing a single dry hop in a single whirlpool. Uh, so no hops in the boil, that's pretty standard for New England IPA recipes. Um, my first recipe, I did three separate Whirlpool editions spaced apart, and I did two dry hops, one during fermentation and one post-fermentation. In this case, we're using a Quike yeast, which is extremely fast fermenting, uh, so I really only have time to do one dry hop, I think, before um, 
the biotransformation period is over. So I'm gonna make sure that I do one massive dry hop and one massive whirlpool, and we'll see what that does. I also changed up the hops that I'm using for the New England IPA. I picked up some Sabro at the home brew shop, and I thought that would be kind of fun to play with. So I suppose I'll probably jump into the recipe now. First ingredient is gonna be 12 pounds of Pilsner malt. Uh, that is just gonna help with our conversion of our adjuncts. There's actually a lot of adjuncts in this beer style. Uh, one of the reasons why it is hazy is because of the amount of proteins that are in suspension. Uh, so the way we achieve that is by getting flaked grains in there and what I'm using is a pound and a half of flaked oats and a pound and a half of flaked wheat. I'm also going to stick an additional half pound of carapels on that to aid with head retention. And that should hopefully give us a pre-boil gravity of about 1051 and uh, hopefully a post-boil gravity of around 1068. We'll see if I hit those numbers or not. And then I'm now on to hops. I'm obviously the star of the show for this style. There are no hops in the boil whatsoever. Uh, they are all going to be post-boil and I'm going to do a single 20 minute whirlpool edition of two ounces of citra two ounces of sabro and one ounce of galaxy uh, and that whirlpool edition will be held at 180 degrees fahrenheit for 20 minutes and that is going to extract a whole bunch of juicy flavor out of these hops in a moderate amount of bitterness like i said quite yeast is a very very fast fermenter and will probably be at high krausen by tomorrow morning so tomorrow morning, I'm going to go ahead and do one massive dry hopping addition, which is two ounces of citra, two ounces of Sabro, and three ounces of Galaxy. The yeast we're using, uh, Voss Quike yeast, um, is supposedly a very clean fermenter, but at the same time, it does produce a significant amount of orange uh, and citrus kind of esters. So this all really kind of plays in to uh, having a huge orange citrus bomb kind of beer. So for the water profile, it's a pretty minerally profile. Um, I do use my own base tap water. I don't use reverse osmosis water. And because of that, my ion counts are somewhat high. Uh, so if you are brewing this beer, I would advise you to keep your calcium counts pretty high, around 100 parts per million. And also advise you to keep your uh, sulfate to chloride ratio relatively low. So you want about twice as much chloride as sulfate counts um, and that is in order to promote the malty side of the beer and to cut down any sort of bitterness that might be produced by the hops. The key of this beer style is not being bitter, it's being juicy, flavorful. You want to do everything you can to really promote that juiciness to come forward versus bitterness. Uh, so making sure that you have a lot more chloride than sulfate is important. So that being said, my water profile is 119 parts per million of calcium. 11 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, 113 parts per million of sulfate, 227 parts per million of chloride, and 36 parts per million of bicarbonate. Your water additions will vary based on your initial base profile, but so I added 7 grams of gypsum, 2 grams of epsom, and 11 grams of calcium chloride to my mash and sparge water uh, in order to get that profile. Finally, for our mash, we're going to mash this at 150 degrees Fahrenheit for about an hour. Now, I've already set up my brewing water with the salts, and it's pretty much up to temp now, so I think we're going to go over and do in. All right, so after we've mashed in, there's gonna be a little trick here that I'm gonna be using for the first time um, to minimize dissolved oxygen in every aspect of this brew going forward. Uh, and that is to be adding some pure vitamin C or ascorbic acid, uh, which is a very strong antioxidant. This is a tip that I learned from Genus Brewing, which is actually a phenomenal YouTube channel on home brewing. Uh, so very knowledgeable guys over there. So hopefully you go check out their content after you watch this video. Uh, but what we're going to do here is add just a pinch, just about a gram or two, and that is going to actually recirculate through this whole thing, and it's going to stay in our brew all the way through fermentation. And it's going to help cut down a lot on the amount of oxygen that gets into this beer, and really should help extend the shelf life quite a bit. So our hour mash is complete, and I'm gonna start collecting the wort now. All right, so this is our pre-boil gravity, um, and it's about 11.8 bricks, which translates to about 10.46 for a uh, pre-boil gravity, which is a bit low. Um, I was kind of hoping for something closer to 10.51, but uh, I'll take it because we can make that up in the boil. Okay, so uh, we just hit our boil, so we're actually adding nothing during the main boil. Uh, but we'll come back with 10 minutes left in the end and we will add a whole lot of yeast nutrient. Um, and that'll be it, so I'll catch you then. All right, so we are now about 
10 minutes from the end of the boil and uh, right now we're about to add some yeast nutrient. Now typically when I'm using standard ale yeast or lager yeast I will add about two and a half teaspoons um, worth of yeast nutrient. Now with quike yeast um, this is actually slightly different. So quike yeast while it will ferment a lot faster, actually does require about double the amount of nutrients required. So instead of adding two and a half teaspoons of yeast nutrient, I'm actually gonna add a full five teaspoons. Uh, so that is gonna be hopefully very helpful in terms of getting us a fast fermentation that's also healthy. So now we're gonna go ahead and wait for another 10 minutes before we kill this boil. All right, so one of the things that is very important to do uh, around the 10 minute mark is to sanitize your chilling system. So whether you have a plate chiller, immersion chiller, counterflow chiller, whatever chilling setup you have, uh, it's very important to, for about 10 minutes left in the boil, recirculate that boiling wort through it so that you uh, basically guarantee that the inside of it is sanitary. This assumes, of course, that the inside of your chilling system of choice is actually clean already. Uh, because sanitation does not necessarily get rid of something that is just plain dirty. All right, so uh, we have just hit the end of our boil. I did extend it a little bit to make up a couple extra gravity points there. Um, but now what we want to do is start moving towards the whirlpool. So what we're going to do is start the chilling process just a little bit here. And um, essentially we're going to bring everything down to about 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So. Once we hit 180, then we're going to try and stop it. Uh, and we're going to leave the whirlpool hops in there for about 20 minutes. But first, we got to get to that point where we actually hit 180 degrees. So what I'm doing now is cooling down and recirculating cooled wort back into the kettle. And once that kettle thermometer reaches about 180 degrees, I think we'll be good to go. Okay, so here is our massive five ounce Whirlpool edition. Two ounces of Citra, two ounces of Sabro, and one ounce of Galaxy. All, all going in right now. So we're gonna let this sit here and uh, maintain about 180 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit for about 20 minutes and then we will continue the chilling process. Okay, so our 20 minute whirlpool is complete now so it's time to actually complete the chilling process. So we're just gonna turn on the chilling water again. And we're gonna wait for our wort temperature to get down to about 100 degrees. So now our wort out temperature is already down to about 100 degrees in about one minute of cooling. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start transferring it over into our fermenter here, which has already been sanitized. So typically to aerate the wort, uh, I will typically just splash it right in. That seems to have worked fine for me in most cases in the past. So I'm gonna do that here. Uh, this particular quite strain, Voss, um, comes in a dry yeast packet, which historically dry yeast has much higher cell counts than liquid yeast. And typically with quite yeast, you really wanna under pitch it. Um, really kind of goes against most conventional notions. So what I'm going to do is follow the manufacturer's instructions and actually not rehydrate the dry yeast and minimally aerate uh, going into the actual fermenter. And what this is going to do is slightly stress the yeast. That's going to encourage more of those orange type esters to come out and it's also going to speed up fermentation. All right, so hopefully by tomorrow morning this will be ready for a dry hop. I'm fully expecting to see activity within the next four hours. All right, so I'm gonna start doing something a little bit differently in my videos now. I'm gonna start talking about the fermentation uh, after I actually transfer everything and with minimal distractions, uh, because that is one of the most important parts about making beer. And I found that most of my videos, I actually have a little bit of a messy, chaotic scene going on when I'm talking about the fermentation, but uh, that's gonna stop now. So both as a time-saving factor and as a like clarifying factor, I'm going to be talking about fermentation in an uncluttered space. And also, uh, this is actually the day of the tasting, so um, I'm just doing this now because I think it's a good video to start doing it on. Um, but bear with me. So everything went pretty well with the brew, and I think it honestly was actually an easier uh, brew session than my last New England IPA was. 
uh, because I just had that one single large uh, whirlpool charge of hops and that was it. Uh, so as opposed to measuring out very specific amounts of three separate whirlpool editions at three separate times, I just threw them all in at one shot and um, I think it worked out pretty well, talking from the future. So for the fermentation of this beer, you're going to want to pitch it at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, normally that's really bad for any other type of yeast strain, but Quike has evolved to really favor those temperatures. It really actually incites activity uh, very, very quickly after you pitch it, and it, it just continues to kind of snowball from there. So the yeast love to be very hot. Um, so what you're going to want to do is keep everything in your uh, fermentation space at probably anywhere from 75 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit for the entire time of fermentation. And that should probably get you a fermentation that lasts between three and seven days, depending on how well you uh, treat the yeast. So like I said, adding the extra amount of yeast nutrient is really pretty important for this particular type of yeast. I made that mistake the last time I used Quike. I actually added just a standard amount of yeast nutrient and it took a long time for it to finish out. And it will finish just in the standard time frame, uh, like your two weeks. But if you do add a lot of extra nutrients, you're going to end up with a pretty decent uh, fast fermentation. So um, also keeping the yeast hot is also going to kind of encourage it to coax out some more of those uh, citrusy flavors that the uh, strain is actually pretty well known for. Basically, yeah, you're going to ferment it somewhere between three and seven days as hot as you can keep it around 70 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and then you should be good to go. And we're also going to dry hop day one uh, of fermentation because this yeast is going to tear through it so fast that that biotransformation period is going to be very, very short. Uh, we want to take advantage of those times that the yeast and the hops will interact and create chemical compounds, which we will taste as juicy flavor. All right, so we're getting an original gravity reading of about 15.2 uh, bricks, which equates to about 1061 uh, on a traditional hydrometer scale. It's a bit low compared to what I expected from the recipe, but there was a lot of absorption from hops, and um, I think I'm gonna be happy with the result regardless, so I'll just have to fine tune my recipe in the future. So one of the amazing things about Quake yeast is how fast that it actually starts fermenting, and uh, this is about 15 hours after we pitch the yeast. Uh, so it's pretty incredibly fast. I actually checked on this about four hours after I pitched and it had finally started forming a Krausen. So uh, one of the other things that Quake is really good about doing is providing a very strong Krausen so you can top crop this thing very, very effectively. What that means is harvest the yeast for later usage in a very, very easy way. So I'm gonna show you very quickly how to top crop your, uh, your Quake yeast. And you can actually do this with any other yeast pretty much if you want to. Uh, just some of them may not provide as much Krausen uh, which might make it a bit difficult to attain a lot of yeast in healthy proportions. You'll need some sort of sanitized ladle and sanitized, very sanitized collection jar. Uh, what I'm going to use is this ball mason jar here, which I use for reharvesting yeast pretty much most of the time. And what you're going to do is very simple. You're just going to grab that foamy Krausen with your ladle of choice and dump it into your sanitized collection jar. Those little brown spots on top of the uh, foam are fresh, healthy yeast cells and uh, will provide you uh, yeast that will last in your fridge for a very, very long time. And all you need to do is pitch it directly if it's quake or make a starter if it's any other yeast. Then what you'll do is add your sanitized lid on the mason jar. Tighten it all the way and then untighten it because we don't want this thing exploding if this continues to ferment in the fridge. But we'll label it and we'll call it, uh, and we'll put it in the fridge. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and do our massive dry hop. This is um, actually the largest dry hop I've ever done on the channel. It's about seven ounces of hops. We got two ounces of Citra, two ounces of Sabro, and three ounces of Galaxy. Uh, all going in right now. Because I'm dry hopping during the biotransformation region, uh, this Krausen is effectively pushing gas out of the fermenter. Oxygen is not getting in right now, and it still has plenty of fermentation left, so we are safe to leave the fermenter open right now. Uh, however, if this was later on, I'd probably not dry hop using this method. I would probably go through the collection jar at the bottom and purge it with CO2. All right, so now we got it all capped up and we'll wait for another couple days um, while uh, fermentation continues and probably finishes out within a couple days. 
And uh, hopefully by then my pressure kit has gotten here so I can actually do a close transfer from this. Okay, so for final gravity, here we are at about five days uh, with a final gravity of 1010. We are currently pressure transferring this over from the Firmzilla directly into the keg now. And uh, well, I'll catch up to you guys in probably like another day for the tasting. Okay, so fermentation went pretty well. As you uh, can see, we got down to our target final gravity pretty fast, about five days. Um, I could have probably pushed it to three days if I just diligently kept everything up to like 90 degrees to 100 degrees, but let's be honest, like I can't freaking sleep uh, if the temperature is over 80 degrees. Uh, so I really had a hard time uh, keeping that hot enough, I would suppose. So I tried to manage everything as I could. We had some very hot days uh, here in New England, 80, 90, even actually hit 100 degrees at one point, uh, one of those days. So there was actually a lot of good time for the ambient temperature in the inside of my apartment to get way up there into the uh, prime quake uh, fermentation range. So I did that while I was away from home and then I just chilled everything down at night uh, to be able to sleep. So yeah, so obviously it did take a little bit longer than I guess if I had uh, tried to diligently keep it around, you know, 90 degrees, but uh, that wasn't gonna happen. So uh, five days, however, is still an oppressive turnaround time uh, compared to most beers. So uh, I had it done at five days, kegged it, and uh, force carbonated it over the last day and a half. Uh, so now it is the evening of day number seven. So um, yeah, we are ready to pour this thing and I think it's gonna be a treat. So let's get to it. All right, so it's called Wicked Stommy and it comes in at 6.8% ABV and 57 IBUs. So I called it Wicked Stommy because, you know, obviously it's a New England IPA, I got used to New England accent, but at the same time, uh, I am inside right now instead of being on my porch because Hurricane Isaias, if that's how you say it, is uh, currently having its way with the East Coast. So uh, things are a bit stormy outside. All right, so for appearances of the beer, it's a pale gold to straw color. Uh, very opaque, milky, in fact. I mean, the haze is extremely thick. Uh, you can't really see into this whatsoever. Um, the head of the beer is very rocky and robust. It really does maintain its structure uh, for a quite a long period of time and uh, does not, those bubbles just stay where they are, which is pretty cool. So it's nice to have good head retention in the beer. It's always kind of a nice kind of cherry on top. Uh, it means that your uh, proteins are doing what they're supposed to be doing. All right, so now we'll go in for aroma. Ooh, all right, so first of all, the aroma in this beer is uh, <laughs> it's quite strong. So literally the entire 12 ounces of hops uh, contributed to the aroma in a certain way, either through the Whirlpool uh, or through the dry hop, but I mean, there is a substantial amount of hop aroma coming out of this. Uh, so I'm getting mostly citrus, uh, so a little bit of grapefruit and also some melon, I think. Very tropical smelling and truly uh, quite, quite a different bouquet of uh, fruit kind of uh, uh, aromas coming out of this. Yeah, there's absolutely no malt character whatsoever on the nose. Um, yeah, it's pretty much uh, citrus dominated, probably some orange in there, I think, uh, in terms of just like really what is the most, um, yeah, I think orange is definitely the most dominant aroma. So now we will move in towards mouthfeel. So it's like, yeah, maybe trending on the medium to medium full body mouthfeel. Uh, very, very smooth. Um, there's a little bit of a carbonation bite because it's a bit young and I force carbonated it, so. That may fade with time, but uh, for the most part, very, very smooth, very round mouthfeel, um, which is exactly what I want in a New England IPA. It's exactly what you're supposed to get. That is 100% due to having a high protein uh, malt bill there. It also has a lot to do with tuning the water chemistry towards this. I would say it's a little less creamy than my last New England IPA was. I think my last one was definitely a lot more uh, pillowy and soft in the mouthfeel. I did change the recipe a little bit on this one, so um, I omitted white wheat from the uh, the grain bill, and that may be responsible for it, maybe. Um, it's not far behind it. I mean, it's still got the whole smooth, pillowy characteristic. I think just the last New England IPA I made was a little bit smoother. So now we're gonna move on to the very important part, the flavor of the beer. It is just absolutely bursting flavor. So this beer involved 12 ounces of hops, right? 
Um, that's a lot more hops than my last New England IPA iteration did, and the seven ounce dry hopping edition that I made was uh, the biggest in channel history, and in, actually it was the biggest dry hop in my entire brewing history. Um, significant amount of hops in this, and uh, no green grass flavor. So I'm very, very proud to report that. That was an issue with the amount of vegetal material that I had in my Cascade Pale Ale um, a couple brews ago. Not an issue in this. There is a small amount of hop burn, uh, which is kind of a phenomenon you get with a young beer that's been heavily dry hopped. There's a little bit of a kind of zing to it um, that comes from uh, those young hops, but that will fade and round out with time. Um, but it's not really significant into a degree that it is a flaw here. Um, it's perhaps a tad more bitter than I expected. Um, it did get a little drier than my last New England IPA, I think. Um, but like maybe one or two gravity points though, so it's not that big of a difference. Um, but it is definitely a little bit more bitter than I think I would have wanted it to be. Definitely a little bit bitter, but it's not really um, too far out of the ballpark. I've definitely had New England IPAs at bars that were a lot more bitter than this is. But it, I probably could have done with a little bit higher final gravity. So maybe I'll add a little bit of dextrin malt in there next time. Uh, just something to keep that final gravity a bit higher. Uh, just so we can keep a little bit more of a sweetness balance on this thing. So the full breakdown of hop flavors is, it, it's a pretty long list. So, um, here we go. Orange, tangerine, a little bit of grapefruit, honeydew melon, specifically honeydew, not cantaloupe, honeydew melon. That's that green one, you know, uh, a little bit more, it's a little bit less sweet than the other melon. And then two very, very interesting flavor additions that uh, one of which was expected and the other one was not. First is coconut. Uh, Sabro hops are 100% responsible for a little bit of a kind of, just a coconut juice kind of flavor. It's in the back half, uh, so you get it at the very end and um, it's there. And I'm not a guy that normally likes coconut, but I did expect this and I wasn't sure what kind of uh, level uh, to which it would be present in the beer. And I uh, came through as just a pretty pleasant, kind of very subtle flavor. So it's not really overwhelming, which is good because coconut is a flavor that, like I said, I can't really stand in a large quantity, but it adds a little bit of a roundness and um, an additional layer of complexity to this beer, which is very welcome. The other flavor that I did not expect it's like a mint, uh, or like a, yeah, like a minty menthol combination. Um, very subtle. And uh, I don't think it really would come through if I wasn't really sitting down and closing my eyes and really thinking about the flavors. But uh, yeah, minty menthol, just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. Um, even less so than the coconut. It's like refreshing. So it's cooling in a way, um, in the way that menthol can be cooling but not, you know, very, very strong. If I had menthol flavor in a beer that was to a significant degree, I would probably be disgusted. But um, this is actually kind of an interesting little background note. And I think it might be part of the coconut thing too, maybe? Maybe my brain is perceiving the coconut slightly in a menthol way. I, I don't know, I'm going down a rabbit hole here. Sabro is one of those weird hops. Um, it is kind of a, an outlier uh, in terms of what kinds of flavors it throws. And uh, I just really wanted to use it because it was just a very interesting hop. And I'd seen a Sabro New England IPA single hop uh, done before. It was pretty tasty and pretty interesting. Um, I would definitely recommend doing that. Like if you want to make a beer that is uh, way out of left field, single hop, Sabro is your way to go. Um, and I think it does pretty well in this beer. This hop combination is pretty good. Um, Sabro Citra Galaxy, pretty good. Uh, it's definitely not the optimal one. Um, I think there's a little bit of competing flavor here, but it's it's pretty good overall, and I think it did a decent job. So, uh, yeah, I think I would probably give this a solid, like, meh, eight and a half, maybe nine out of 10. It's a very, very good beer. Very drinkable, even at 6.8%. Uh, it really does check all the boxes in terms of what I want out of a New England IPA, in terms of the style, and um, just as a good drinking experience. Uh, I think it's gonna be very, 
good for a long period of time. Um, I'll let you know if it oxidizes. I am not going to hide from my brewing flaws. One other thing I think is worth discussing that is using a quike yeast versus any other kind of typical classic New England IPA yeast like London Ale 3 or like the Conan strain um, or any of those other uh, classic East Coast IPA type strains. Uh, the only real benefit to using that quite yeast is that super fast fermentation, which in turn will retain more of the hop character over time because you're basically saving time with it. If you're on the fence between using a classic strain like a London Ale 3 versus a Quike, I think I'm gonna urge you to go the Quike route. Um, there's really no reason not to. It's, uh, it's much more versatile in terms of temperature. So most home brewers out there don't really have some sort of dedicated fermentation chamber setup where they can dial in that temperature very precisely. So given it being summer out and the temperatures are higher, Quike is really a lot more friendly to this type of thing versus a English ale yeast because English ales like to be fermented on the lower 60s. Uh, they like to be a little bit colder, and a quike yeast really loves to be hotter. That's a lot more friendly towards those of us who don't really have much fermentation control. Uh, honestly, in this beer style, there's a lot of hops, uh, so I really it's really kind of hard to look for yeast flavor, um, but I really can't pick up any if I'm trying to look for it. If I had to change anything, I would back sweeten it a bit, maybe add a little bit of lactose or some dextrin malt in the mash just to make sure that our final gravity is a little bit higher, maybe somewhere around like 10, 14, uh, that will help balance out some of the perceived bitterness. And I think that would add a little bit more roundness to the mouthfeel. Um, but other than that, I really can't think of that much to uh, improve on it. So very happy. And the Frenzilla did really well. Um, I did not have a pressure kit on it until I transferred um, and that's okay. I think it probably would have just been even better with pressure fermentation to keep all those volatiles in there. Um, but you know, we'll always have another round and we'll always have another chance to try that. So very happy with the way it turned out. So first of all, if you like the beer and you think you might wanna make it yourself, the recipe is available to you in the description box down below, as is the case with all of my videos and all of my beers. I'm never gonna hide that recipe from you guys. So, uh, so if you think you might like brewing a certain beer that I've made on the channel, it's always gonna be in that description box. All right, thanks for watching everybody. If you like the content, if you like watching me do this type of thing, please hit the like and the subscribe button. Both of those things really do help out my channel quite a bit as well as comments if you want to talk about any aspect of this beer or the brewing process or the hops or yeah really anything about this beer feel free to drop a comment down below in the comment section I do read every single comment and I do my best to respond to as many of them as I can in a timely fashion I do work a full-time job though so sometimes that uh, takes a little bit but uh, I do read them all I typically will upload a new grain of glass video to YouTube roughly every two three weeks depending on how fast I can brew or how fast I can empty a keg uh, but at the same time, if you want more frequent updates on the order of every few days, feel free to follow me on Instagram. That is at the apartment brewer on Instagram, and there you can see what I am actually making in real time and what will make its way to the YouTube channel within a couple of weeks. Also in the description box down below, you're gonna find a complete list of all of my home brewing equipment to include the firm Zilla. Uh, and links to Amazon where you can purchase those things for yourself if you happen to be in the market for it. Just be advised that if you do click on one of those links and buy something, I do earn a very small commission, but it's at no additional cost to you, and it does go right back into supporting this channel, so I do appreciate it. So in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and finish off the rest of this beer while I finish out editing the video, and uh, I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers. Cheers.